If you want to learn about what it's like working in the trades or for a general contractor, then don't miss this episode of Digital Builder. You'll get a close look at the incredible benefits these careers offer, plus a whole lot more. Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Autodesk's Digital Builder Podcast, a show that inspires construction professionals to innovate and use technology to improve how they build our world. I'm Eric Thomas, and I've been working in construction for nearly a decade. And now I have the privilege to sit down with industry trailblazers to hear how they're solving construction's biggest challenges and redefining the future of the built environment. Welcome to Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast. I am your host, Eric Thomas. Today, we are coming to you from the Boston Technology Center, and I am joined by Savvy Francis, a pipe fitter with EM Duggan, and Kelsey Gager, the National Director of Operational Excellence with Suffolk Construction. And today, we are going to be talking about some really fun stuff, the Make It Real program from Autodesk. We're going to be talking about some construction careers, a day in the life, both in the trade side and the GC side, a whole bunch of really fun stuff. So without further ado, how are you both doing today? Great. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I am so excited to get into this. And I feel like we could have taken our kickoff call when we met a few weeks ago. And that could have been its own podcast in itself because we were you know, all very fired up about you know, construction trades and careers and a bunch of really cool things. But I want to start off today by giving a little bit of context on what brought all three of us together today. And it's Honored Us Make It Real program. And If you're not familiar with that, it's essentially a program that encourages young people to engage with their communities through construction in the built environment. And the program offers inspiration, learning, and funding opportunities. And there's also $100,000 available in flexible funding to empower young people on the path to construction careers. So the team recently launched a video series called Bridging Gaps, which is where our connecting uh, thread comes from, which is a video series where Honored Us partnered with hockey star Connor Clifton in football football champ James Devlin, and they're both engineering school grads, and they're helping bring the next generation of designers and builders together. So you should check out that series. And if you're watching or listening, a link to uh, some of those episodes will be in our show notes. But again, welcome. And I'm just very curious, Kelsey, can you tell me what was it like meeting Connor and James when you were filming your appearance in the series? Yeah. So uh, Connor and, and James are, are great guys. We uh, we had an amazing time out at the Parcel 12 project, which is a sophisticated, you know, two towers over the Mass Pike job um, that, that we're working on right now. Um, we, we got out there um, and it was, you know, it was a brisk New England day. It was cold. The wind was whipping. I know you remember, Savvy, we were out yep. there, we had our jackets on. So everyone was a little bit quiet when we, when we first got out there. And as soon as we pulled out, you know, Spot the Robot, which is a robot dog um, from Boston Dynamics that we brought for the visit for the film. Um, as soon as we got that out and we started um, talking about, you know, the site and the filming and the conversation just started uh, flowing. And uh, James and Connor, you know, they asked a bunch of really good questions about Spot. I was really, um, you know, appreciative of how engaged they were and curious about, you know, how do we get value out of this robot and how are we putting, you know, everything together out on the job site. And so um, we had a just a, a really fun time um, meeting them and um, and getting to to explore the job. It just it was a great day. Yeah, I appreciate that visibility that they're bringing to the conversation as well. And did you have a, a similar feeling when uh, when you're getting to meet the guys? I actually did. They were very nice in person, especially James. Um, I did a few Zooms with him with the students as well. So it was nice to finally see meet him in person. And it was just funny walking down Newberry Street to the job site, like being with a uh, former football player and now Bruins who's in the in the run for like the championship no one recognized them like we were just walking and they, yeah. they were they no made helmet and equipment no, nothing <laughs> and they just made everything very comfortable Oh, that's fantastic. And, and I just, I think it's so cool the the way they're driving and leading that conversation. And I, I'm really looking forward to more episodes of that coming out. And so, you know, as we as we think about this, Savvy, I also know you were a part of a, a different but related program here in Boston called Building Pathways. And could you tell me a little bit more about what that program's like and how you discovered it? Sure. Building Pathways is a pre-apprenticeship program that helps people that live in the city Minorities, females, and veterans getting to a trade for the Boston 
trades. Um, I was actually working at a nonprofit organization. I did apply for other unions in the fire department prior to that in the recession put a halt on a lot of things. So as I was working at the nonprofit, I received a flyer for the Building Pathways. And I said, you know what, this is my golden ticket to try to get into a union. And it's crazy because everybody in my family, all the males are union members. So I ended up going to the info session, had to do what I had to do studied up on my math, actually worked out a little bit because I didn't know how intense the test was going to be. And I passed everything. It was, it's a seven week program and they brought us to different facilities, training facilities and different job sites to decide which trade we wanted to go into. So my original was the electricians, IBEW 103, because I have uncles and cousins that are members, um, I wanted to do iron workers and the bricklayers because I knew people in those unions. Then when we went to 537's training facility, I said, you know what? This is where I want my career. I'm going to start my own path, my own footprints instead of joining where I knew people. So I graduated in December 2012 from Building Pathways. It's it's cycle three, the all female class, which... It started off at 13 and then 10 women ended up graduating and going into different unions. Um, I went to the Pipe Fitters Hall in January of 2013 and applied and then got in in June of 2013. And it's just been skyrocketing ever since. Jumped on the rocket ship from there. But yes. you, you make a really great point just in, like you had some visibility on some aspect of where the trades could go, but it wasn't until you got into the program, you started seeing some of these options, which right. I, th- I think sets up some of our, our later questions in the conversation as far as that visibility goes. But you know, now that you're a pipe fitter and you've got that kind of baseline in your career path for can you give me a little bit more details about what a, a typical day in the life is? Like, wh- what what do you do every day? And, you know, why should other people be excited about following in your footsteps? I get up extremely early. Um, to I'm up at five every day. So, you know, I'm, I'm in that crazy people territory with you. <laughs> yes. And then so I get to the job site. Our foreman gives us our task for the day. And we usually have an apprentice work when we have an apprentice now because the job's starting to wind down where I'm at. So we only have two. And then it's me and another journeyman who's on the job site. So the the tools are out. Um, but on a typical day, if it was not a not towards the end of the finishing job, there could be 10 or more guys on the job. So we're looking at the blueprints, making sure we have stock for the piping, whether it's copper or SCED 40 pipe that needs to be welded or VIC um, pipes that need to be clamped. We make sure gang boxes are open on time. Everything's out that we need to make sure we get through the day, at least by coffee or lunch, and then restock everything. It's just, it's so much that goes into it. So each person may have a different task. Like one person may be doing carpet lines for a fan coil unit. Another person may be in the shaft actually welding something. So it's just so much that goes into it. And then at the end of the day, we pack up and go home. I, I love that too, because it sounds like there's no single day is, is the same as the prior day. You, you've got an opportunity to to see different things and touch different things. And I'm not sure other people have that visibility as far as the, the diversity of potential, even just within one single trade. So I, I appreciate that context. And I'd love to compare it to your experience as well, Kelsey. So I know you've been with Suffolk for a while. You started with their Career Starts program and, you know, today being, you know, National Director of Operational Excellence. So can you, can you tell me what a day in the life is for you and, you know, how that compares and contrasts a little bit with what Savvy's up to? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Suffolk has, I've been with, with the company for nine years now, and I've they've given me so many opportunities to work in across so many different facets of the of the company. It's been great. I think I've had uh, seven roles now in nine years, nice. so um, which has been tremendous experience. I um, Operational excellence is, is where I sit today. And people ask, you know, what is that? What does operational excellence mean? What do you guys do? Um, And really what that function at the company is focused on is identifying what are the best standards at the company, what are the best-in-class solutions, technologies, uh, trainings, processes, 
and identifying those and making them standards for the company so we can all excel and be the best of the best, continuously improve and really be operationally excellent. Um, and so, so that's what my group focuses on. It spans so many different aspects of the company. Um, we have, you know, under our umbrella, we have construction learning, um, our process excellence group, um, construction technology. Um, we have so many different parts of the company really come together under that umbrella. Um, and so what does that mean for me? What does that mean I get to work on every day? Um, a lot of really exciting things. We also start really early at Suffolk. I think that's a that's an industry thing. Um, and, you know, you get into the office early. Um, there's a lot of people around. People are collaborative. Um, there's good energy. We have um, our offices are over in, in Roxbury, um, right off of Massachusetts Avenue. And um, you get in there, there's, you know, there's a, we have our cafe, we have um, a gym there and it's just, it's packed in the morning. People love to get in early. We have like a, a really get after it culture. Um, people, people like to be in the office and they, um, they like to see each other's faces and spend time together, which is great. I love that aspect of our culture. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I get in, we, um, we, I spend a lot of time um, with those different groups I mentioned, but also other functions at the company that really are supporting and contributing to this operational excellence effort. And um, and what I mean by that is like we have our, our in-house data team, we have um, our IT team, we have, um, again, so many different contributors uh, internally at, you know, on the construction side of the business, but also we have a lot of um, other verticals at the company that contribute towards providing and equipping our teams with the best in class tools and and solutions. Um, and that could be our SEPIC technologies team, um, which is focused on, you know, investing in construction and in the um, construction technology space. Uh, that could be SEPIC design, which is our in-house architecture team. So collaborating across all those different facets, um, a lot of uh, a, a lot of work, a lot of day to day work with those groups. And then I'd say another piece of it um, that's really important in my day to day is spending time at the job site level. Um, you know, we don't just want to sit in the office and come up with all these different solutions. I mentioned it's about identification. It really is genuinely about that. You have to get out to the field to understand the pain points. Um, what are uh, what are the solutions that are working for jobs and how can we break down those, um, you know, traditional barriers of being isolated on a single job site? And so we're, you know, uh, collecting those lessons learned, sharing those lessons learned, um, making sure that those are coming back to the center and then going back out. And so I spend a lot of time on the sites. You know, I still have, you know, my hard hats, my boots. I'm never going to give those up. That also has to occur at the national level. And so um, I actually get to frequently travel to our other regions on, you know, a, a pretty frequent basis, which is an amazing opportunity. I, I love seeing um, Suffolk and other markets. And uh, that's another key piece about OPSEX is, is um making sure that not only do we have those um, best in class standards at our Northeast region, but also at our other regions from New York to, you know, Miami to to San Francisco. So, um, so that's a big part of it. So it's exciting. Um, like I mentioned, I get to work with people from all different backgrounds with different skill sets um, and, and different areas of focus. So, um, you know, you have to be really organizationally dynamic and agile um, in, in my day-to-day -day role, but um, it's something that keeps it really exciting. And one of the reasons I've stuck around in State of Suffolk. In, in the, the data nerd in me, like I've got lights going off in the back <laughs> of my head because as you get into that conversation too, when you keep saying standards, and I'm I'm ex I'm so happy to hear that because a lot of uh, the, the people that I speak to when they're starting to get deeper into their technology journey or their data journey, that's where we always come back to because as your company scales in size too, I, I love your perspective on you're looking at the national level, but to be able to do that, you have to be very focused at those regional levels, even down to the project level, because if your standards aren't consistent and people aren't going about things in a way that has a level of commonality to give you that global lens, it's still kind of guesswork. You're, you're not going to be able to put a dashboard together that has that feels authentic, I don't believe, because, right. you know, project A captured things completely different than project B and project C isn't doing it at all. And they're on a different tool and, you know, down the rabbit hole we go. So it's it's a really deep and, and meaningful role. And I think what you're doing, especially around the job, that, that connects the dots between what Savvy's doing as well, because you're out there listening and hearing what, you know, the trades people are doing and what their challenges are. And I, I really like how you're hearing the problem and then finding the solution, not just coming, here's a new piece of technology and here's a new solution to a problem you didn't identify as a problem, because that really means people are, are going to adopt that technology. And it's a conversation, not, you know, a dictatorship at that point. And, and I think I'd like 
like to stay onto that thread for a moment, and I'd like to kick this next question back to Savvy. So if you if you think about the the start of your career, how has your use of technology changed and evolved to where you're using it today out on the project site? So when I got in, it was the start of a machinery called the Trumbull machine. Um, but before then, I was the first job site I was at was Old Colony in South Boston. We re- redid the projects over there. And that was more so like a wooden structure type. Um, but I know when I went to the next job site at the Millennium Tower, which was, I never knew what a tremble was. I just, I realized it's like the the blueprint inside of a machine. It's crazy how like if something doesn't seem right, they can just call the office and everything just gets updated right then and there. And it's like, and then hearing about like my uncles talking about yardsticks, which they still use till this day on some job sites. I've seen guys use them. It's just like weird seeing how everything's changing. I know we use ProPress um, by Milwaukee or DeWalt that took over for a soldering. Technology is just taking over everything. Like the jobs are going quicker as well because of the technology so on and so forth. But um, it's interesting to like know these things because I might be working next to an old timer who's getting ready to retire and didn't know how to use a particular tool. And I come just because I just learned how to use it um, on another job site. I get to show him or her and they're fascinated by it as well because they never um, got to use it as well until that day I bring it in to show them that I found in the, the gang box. Like, oh, yeah, let's just use this. And yeah, so technology is just changing. And I love that relationship you're talking about right there because there's such an in, we're at in a very important point in our industry where there are a lot of people that are trending towards retirement and they have a lot of knowledge that we need. And the younger generations or people who are just coming out of programs in trade schools, regardless of their age, are being trained up on this technology where people who have been on site for 40 years may not have. But we have to have that intersection of those two groups to transfer that knowledge into the newer people who are stepping on site. Because the moment we lose that in five or 10 years, we're going to be in trouble. Like there, there's a lot of knowledge that we have to retain. And so as we have a more, I think, honest approach to adopting technology, it, it builds those relationships. And it's a it's a two-way learning thing where the, the, the older person or the person who's been doing it a certain way learns something new with technology. Maybe they get to go home an hour faster now because they learned a new process they weren't familiar with. But at the same time, they're downloading all this knowledge from 30 years of career experience to the person who might have more baseline tech understanding. And it's I, I, I'm hearing it more and more, and I'm hearing less of the just general pushback to technology adoption. And it's, it's encouraging because I think we're at a, a crux where we have to have it. So Kelsey, can you tell me a little bit about how that's changed in your role? I mean, I know, you know just the nature of your title and role, you're deep in the weeds and technology. Technology, but how has that evolved in the last nine years at Suffolk? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of moments that are kind of seared in my mind from my early days at Suffolk. So I'll, I'll share a couple of uh, a, a couple of those. I um, I remember when I first started back in 2014, I was staffed as um, as a project engineer out in the field, and one of the tasks that I was given for the day to day was managing our weekly work plans, managing our pull plans, managing our our schedules and the tasks that we were um, that we were assigning at the trade partner level on a on a day to day basis. And so, in order to do that, we take that you know master construction schedule, and we really break it down to smaller increments of here's what's actually going to happen out on the site on the day to day. Um, and one of the, the methodologies that we um, we leverage at Suffolk is the last planner system, a, a lean approach to, to short term and, um, and production planning. And so in order to do that, uh, we would take, you know, sticky notes and we put them up on this wall. And so I remember the first the first pull plan I conducted um, was, you know, it was it was in a uh, it was in a trailer that was um, next to this job site. I was working on a couple of hotels in South Boston and um, we were all kind of crowded around in this trailer and we were sitting around this this big pull planning wall. And you can imagine it's just you know 15 different colors of sticky notes they're all you know the the plumber has a sticky note electrician has a sticky note drywaller just everybody con- gets their controlled chaos, their controlled chaos <laughs> and it's up on this board and um and, and it's it's great it's a collaborative session we're having great conversations and we're talking about you know potential conflicts and sequence of events and uh, the the conversation's great but 
I'm sitting there and I'm wondering, how is this still, you know, on this, uh, why there's a screen right behind us, you know, why are we, why are we using this wall in yeah. front of us? And, um, and so I remember I took, um, you know, at the time we were using this blue beam and it, it wasn't quite cloud-based, but I could kind of finagle it to, to create digital sticky notes. And so I made this little, you know, digital sticky note, uh, pull plan up on, up on the computer and my, my superintendent, my lead super thought it was, thought it was the coolest thing. And, um, and I just reflect on that moment and I think about where we are today. Um, and one of the initiatives that we have underway um, at Suffolk is we're actually building our own custom developed short-term planning solution in-house that integrates with P6, that takes all of that data, that automatically, you know, sequences your, your work for you and helps produce a snapshot weekly work plan without having to do any of that analog work that we were do doing in the past. And, um, and I think about, you know, th those were the days when, um, you would you were kind of um it, you were kind of focused just on your scope of work in a lot of ways because we didn't have cloud-based solutions. We didn't have digital ways of connecting. And you really had to get people in a room to have those conversations. And I really think it's incredible um, the strides that we've made um, from a technology perspective to enable that digital collaboration um, and, you know, produce custom developed solutions at general contractors that we can um, give to our trade partners to, to equip them to perform as efficiently and effectively and as safely as possible. Um, and so that's that's one of those moments that's seared in my mind. And then I'll, I'll give one more because this one was particularly painful for me. Um, we uh, we used to have digital cameras. I think everyone did this for photo documentation, oh, yeah. the, the right? The beefy one instead oh, of yeah. carrying your phone around or something else. <laughs> um, because because you had used to have to plug your phone in to get photos from it. Right? And everyone remembers those days. And so... Um, we uh, that was another task that I was assigned as a project engineer out in the field <laughs> in the first few weeks and yeah. few months of my work. Dragging a wagon of plans behind you with a exactly. two point one megapixel camera, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was tasked, you know, take all the progress photos. So every week I would go out on Fridays and I'd, I'd go wall to wall in every single room and I would take a photo, um, and then I would go back to my computer and I would plug my uh, camera into that and then I would upload the photos and then I would sit for about three or four hours. Um, on a Friday, and I would relabel all of those photos and then post them to a single drive and then wait, you know, the 45 minutes for those to get uploaded to our to our central project management system. And uh, again, I reflect back on that. And um, we were an open space user, um, which is a virtual reality 360 platform. We use it on every job to collect um, photo documentation now. And uh, and to see where we've come. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm a little jealous of the project engineers today that don't have to go through that painful process. Um, it was a great learning experience, but uh, to see us come from, you know, having the three to four hours of unproductive time and, you know, I'd sit there and listen to, I think it was iTunes at the time. I don't think Spotify was even a thing yet, but, <laughs> um, but to, to come to where we are today, where, you know, we've, we've actually scaled a solution that solves that problem sure. and we've scaled it to every single job. And I think that's one of the really, um, incredible things that I've seen at Suffolk is that uh, we don't just innovate on one site, is that when we identify that solution that works, we get it on every site. Yeah. And and I think that really leans into our data strategy as well, where, um, you know, if everyone's using consistent tools, we can all organizationally learn from that. Um, and so that's that's one, been one of our focus areas. And again, um, those those are some of the, you know, big strides I've seen um, within the industry. And I think, you know, with the with the digital kind of transformation underway right now, I think we're just going to continue to see it get better. Yeah, and it's so encouraging to see so much focus on our industry and creating technology that does solve these gaps because I'm not going to go too, too deep into it because that could be its own episode, but like the labor challenges that we're having – Obviously, we need to find ways to augment our labor to save time and let people do what people do best and focus on that. And these are some of those ways that we can fill those gaps. And so there's a huge impact. There's a huge ROI. And, and if we're not embracing these types of tools and technologies, those companies are going to eventually go out of business if they're not being progressive enough to do it. And even outside of the labor shortages, if you can say four hours, that means you'll go home at four or 5 p.m. on Friday instead of six or seven or 8 p.m. And that's a key aspect of getting more people to come back into construction because it's a hard sell when you say, hey, you're going to work 
50, 60 hours a week and maybe on Saturday because we're struggling to finish the schedule and the liquidated damages are approaching and we're all freaked out by it. You know, so I, I appreciate that level set and it's just getting faster and faster. But it also means that we need people like you to set that baseline because without standards, now we're just chasing shiny new toys. And then we go into data chaos land and that doesn't do anybody any favors. I love the passion in both of your your voices here as we're talking about this. And so one thing I do love about our industry is when you get to you know drive through a town that you live in and you've worked there and you've built there a lot, you see things you've touched and you've built or you know processes and everything. And so I'd like to hear one thing each of you has built that you're the most proud of. And Savvy, could you could you give us a baseline for that? What uh, what comes to mind first? I would say the very first job site I stepped on was one of my favorite ones because it was when I got my foot through the door, um, working at Old Colony and then driving past it all the time. And then I'd say Millennium Tower because it's one of the tallest buildings I helped build, 55 stories. Nice. And then I'd say the casino as well, Encore Casino. I was there for 18 months. And then uh, actually I graduated that year. And then afterwards I got pregnant in 2019 and went back for a few months um, to continue working there and then went back to another job site. But I'd say those are my favorite ones and being able to point them out just like my uncles and my grandfather did, which used to, I used to be like, oh my God, why do I have to listen to them? <laughs> Tell me I helped build that. And yeah, now every time I you do drive it. By, yes, yeah. <laughs> I do it too. And then it's funny, people will go to the casino a lot and tell me, oh yeah, you guys did a great job. But I was on the hotel part of it. And then, of course, a lot of times because they they go there a lot, they get free rooms on certain nights. So they're like, oh, they'll tell me the heat and the cooling sucks in there. I was like, hey. And they're just joking. They're like, <laughs> we know you did it. But th there's like the rooms that, that I guess they're beautiful. I haven't gone to the hotel part um, yet, but I've gone to the conference rooms because we had a Women's Build Boston conference there back in October last year that had 700 people in attendance. And being able to see what I helped put together, it was just like, wow, like, I can't believe I said I wasn't coming back here after I built it because I was sick. Of, I, I hate that tunnel <laughs> going. Anything past that tunnel, um, I dread. But being able to be like, wow, this is beautiful, like seeing the final product and that's going to be there years to come at, even after I pass away. Now my kid gets to tell people my mother helped build that. That's cool. You know, I've, I've got some places in my hometown where my you know family had uh, a hand in some of that. And, you know, we will do it still. You drive by and you go, yeah, that little tower on top of that. Yeah, yes. that's part of our, you know, history or what. So how about yourself? Is uh, anything come to mind first as far as the, you know, most proud of? So um, I just have to say the savvy just listed three Suffolk jobs. So I'm really excited that we're on the same page. And also I actually worked on the Encore Casino as well. I um, I worked on the tower. Um, I was in a project management role on, in on interior finishes. So we clearly have had a lot of overlap, which is um, amazing to, to hear that. Um, but, uh, you know, I agree com wholeheartedly that, um, you know, seeing there's nothing like driving by a building that you helped build. Um, it's an incredible feeling seeing that that really tangible product and knowing that you contributed to the massive amount of effort that goes into doing that. Right. Um, and that's that's certainly something I'm I'm definitely proud of as well. I think um, for me, I'm, I'm also really proud of the um, the innovation uh, ecosystem and the foundation of our innovation culture at Suffolk that I've really helped contribute to in a lot of ways. Um, I, uh, for a little bit of time, I worked on our construction technology group um, on that side, uh, our operations focused construction tech group. And I, um, we built out an entire, you know, piloting system. We built out a database um, in partnership with our data team um, that tracked all of this pilot data and all of this construction tech and adoption data. Um, and, uh, and we built out a, a innovation champion network. And there were a few different initiatives that we worked on um, over the last few years. And we really started that journey a while ago. I think it was early for the industry. Um, and a lot of that had to do with, um, with, with our CEO and founder, John Fish. He um, is really dedicated to investing in um, innovation. I mean, we have a you know a data team of I think over twenty five people now at this point that's helping fuel those insights and, and, and collect impressive. that information. That, that's a lot. It is a lot in our industry. It's yeah. it's incredible. Um, and to see that and 
Um, and so I'm, I'm really proud of, uh, of that. I think, you know, we have a, we have this thread throughout the entire company of just curiosity, endless curiosity and um, a mind for problem solving. And we have people that love to come together and share stories about how they've um, solved a particular um, issue out on a job site that was you know, incredibly sophisticated and complex. And, um, and and they like to share those stories. And and then on the receiving end, we have people who, who love to hear that and then apply that um, to their next project. And I, I think that culture is so important. Um, and that's how we continuously improve and, and get better as an industry, um, those share that sharing and those lessons learned. And, um, and you mentioned like the brain drain, I think it's more important than ever that, you know, we're uh, collecting all of that information in a digital way. Um, you know, encouraging that reverse mentoring that you mentioned. Um, and, um, yeah, so I, I think that's a, a big, uh, a, a big piece of, um, you know, what I'm, what I'm proud of and contributed to today for Suffolk. And there's a lot to think about in that realm. I mean, there's there's just such a cool feeling when you get to walk through the halls of something you've touched. And I remember the first time I, I got to do a site walk on a proposal that I had helped win where – for me, especially since I'm I'm not the builder, and I'll very openly say that it was really cool to be like, okay, we spent many weeks on this. We won; it was a big win or an important win for our company. And then maybe six months, twelve months later, getting to walk through the early stage of it and say, okay, like even though I'm not the one that built it, I still was a, a contributor. And it's cool to see that technical narrative of how we're going to build it turn into something that's actually in front of us, you know, so it's, it all comes full circle. And I think it's one of those things we can use to convince others to be more interested in this industry too, because we are creating and generating things and being able to step back and just go, oh, there it is, you know, it, it has some value. And, and we kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier in our conversation, but I want to kind of hone in on it more because I, I want to make sure we're finding more ways to bring people into either the trades like you've uh, gone through your Yourself or into general contractors and talking about that is, is I think, a key way of doing so. And so, Savvy, can you tell me a little bit more about some of the, the misconceptions you hear about a career in the trades and, and why those might not be so accurate? So I remember people saying, you're crazy going into the construction field, you're 5'2", you're little, like, um, it's going to be hard, are you going to be able to wake up and go to work since you're you're a late sleeper. And I, I always had installed in my head that my grandfather used to say, don't think about work, just get up and go. And for me, working with the guys that were in it for a while or a long time, I should say, they've taught me how to work smarter and not harder to make sure I came into the job site this uh, and leave the same way I came in. Yeah. Um you're going to work alongside a journeyman who's experienced because at the end of the day, once they retire, we take on the knowledge that they given us the tools and everything and help pay for their pension. And I look at people like this is not hard work at all. I was always installed and told by one of the journeymen I worked with. Don't say can't. If I tell you to go pick up a 10 foot piece of pipe, that's three inches um, thickness come back and let me know I you need help. Don't tell me you can't. And then I worked on the job site until I was eight and a half months pregnant. So I was on light duty. Yes, but it wasn't hard for me either. Um, being able to know what I was doing prior to to my task helped me a long, a long way of being able to know I was going to be safe on the job site. Um, and everything's there, like, especially Doug and gives you the correct uh, PPE, the, the right harnesses. Um, they always gives us give us gloves. They always um, they always give us what we need in order to do the job safe in a timely manner too. And I'm really encouraged to hear that they set you up to be successful and comfortable staying on the site as long as you did in your pregnancy, because I, I had a very impactful conversation some weeks back, and we talked about this a bit as well, because not everybody has the full perspective of how do we be equitable and accommodating to ensure that you know somebody gets pregnant as a tradesperson, what does that look like? And are we setting up somebody to be comfortable to even ask their manager what that looks like either before or after they get pregnant? And obviously, I'm not ever going to be a woman that's pregnant on a job site. And so hearing about that from people like yourself is really important. So I appreciate you sharing that perspective. Um, and I'm not sure that's always been everybody's lived experience, unfortunately. So I right. hope that we get to continue facilitating and encouraging that 
security and safety. And I think also our unions uh, play a big role in creating an environment like that as well. So right. um, thank you for sharing that. No problem. You're and, welcome. Uh, yeah. And so how does how does that compare with your lived experience as far as being at a GC and uh, some of the, the misconceptions as far as getting into the industry? I see... There's a there's a few misconceptions about getting into construction. I agree. When I you know first considered getting into construction, um, a lot of my friends as well. What are you? What is that? What are you going into? Um, and I have a, a non traditional background. I came from a small liberal arts college um, in, in Western Mass, and uh, and I you know I'd spent my summers in college doing archaeology digs, and I decided that you know construction was the industry for me. So um, there's a lot of different pathways and, and ways to getting into the industry, but. Um, I see there's a lot of misconception around how advanced the industry is. I think there's there's a perception that it's, you know, it's antiquated, it's dirty, um, and that, you know, it doesn't always have the same curb appeal as, as you know, an industry like tech or or, um, or or other industries in that in that same regard. And um I, I, th I feel like that's so wrong. I think, you know, the the um the work that we are the buildings that we're building today are so sophisticated and um, and just you know physical feats in a lot of ways, and we're building them with time strapped with strict deadlines, and you know owners that are uh, really demanding, and we have you know really really compressed margins, and we're still able to do it, um, and we have people that are working so hard out in the field to to stand these buildings up, and they're leveraging incredible technology. I mean, we're we're everything like you mentioned gets built digitally beforehand which is amazing. It all gets coordinated. We're collaborating with the trade partners. We're collaborating with the designers. And all of those thousands of moving parts, materials coming on site, um, you know, the, the materials are coming from Canada. They're coming from Turkey. They're coming from, you know, Italy. And uh, they're they're getting flown in. They're getting, they're coming in all different ways to our site. They have to be um, exactly the right dimensions. They have to all come together and come into place. And that, that takes hundreds, sometimes thousands of people on a job oh, site yeah. every day. And, you're just and they all have delivery. to be, you know, it's, it's... Boom, it's there the moment it needs to get installed. It's exactly. crazy. Exactly. And all of those pieces have to come together and get executed flawlessly in order to to meet these uh, these deadlines that we have, and so I, I think it's just it's incredible to um, to witness that, and um, I think it's a you know a general misconception that you know it, things just kind of come together magically. Um, but it's like you but send they a bunch don't. of people out it's, with hammers and they go build the building. It's like eh, it's not. not it's it's that, everything yeah. is orchestrated and planned down to the last detail, down to the last day, yeah. and every individual that's on site is meant to be there and is contributing in some way to that building, and so. Um, I think that's that's one misconception I see. And then I think another one um, is just around the the types of roles in the industry. I think people tend to think um, they tend to think about construction in a very linear fashion. So you have, you know, your architect designs your building, your engineer engineers your building, make sure the designs sound your GC organizes the trades and then the the trades, the, the subcontractors execute on the work. And the reality is that that is it does not happen that way. I mean, you know it. The, and it needs the, to be more of a 360 conversation exactly, these days anyway. Exactly. And so to build that digital model, the trade partners have to be at the table. The architect has to be at the table. The GC has to be at the table. The engineer, the owner, everyone has to come together. Um, and the reality is, is that that building gets designed, coordinated and executed with all of those stakeholders and with all of those people supporting. And there's roles beyond that. There's, as I mentioned, there's data scientists, there's data engineers that are looking at this and and gathering insights and making sure that we're getting smarter on the next job. There are people in operational support roles that are training the next generation. Um, there are people that are building those BIM models that I mentioned. There's VDC coordinators. There's so many different roles uh, that contribute to the success of a project. There's surveyors. There's there's so many um, different aspects of building of the built world that you can get into. And it's expansive. And the industry has so many different opportunities. There's basically endless you know, areas of interest. And so I think um, that is a misconception. And I think that you know, deters people from getting into, it, into the industry because they're not necessarily aware of all of those different opportunities. Yeah, and I think as we, we kind of step more into the, the openness there, it's, it's exciting because we're also learning now, and we're kind of forced to in the last few years, that butts in seats is not what equates productivity in most industries. And construction's a little bit different, obviously, because we are we are building something. But for roles like you're talking about with like training, especially with a lot of digital training offerings or the data and technology piece, 
you can have somebody who lives in an entirely different state who just owns your data strategy and understands this because they're a data scientist. And that is a huge opportunity and brings tremendous value to construction. And you can bring people in from non-traditional backgrounds. I mean, I, I didn't start in that. I was a technical communications major and then stumbled into proposal management. And you now here we are having this conversation. And so I think as we, we keep showing people that there are those paths and somebody can step back and go, I can see myself in that role now. I think that's kind of the, the decisive factor. And it, it all kind of takes a little bit of work um, from, from everybody, regardless of your seat in construction. But I think it leads into my next uh, question. And I know both of you have had the opportunity to speak to students and other younger people about our industry. So what are some of those most common blockers that you're seeing that keep them from considering a, a career in the trades or many other different construction roles? Um, Savvy, I, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts there. I would say a lot of people don't talk about the benefits and pay about it. Um, I was in at in Cambridge recently speaking to high schoolers and you could see like I, I want to say more so like social media has taken over this generation. So they want to do TikTok. They want to do the Instagram type of thing. Um, but then once you speak about the difference between in the envelope and outside the envelope for pay, especially for union construction jobs, their eyes open. And then you let them know that you go through an apprenticeship, especially a licensed trade like myself, the electricians, the plumbers, sprinkler fitters. And those are skilled trades. And that's something that cannot be taken from you either. Um, you'll have some type of knowledge to be able to build something, even if that's not, even though I'm a pipe fitter, I pay attention to the other trades around me. So that way I'm not paying somebody from Google to just come to my house for a $150 show up because I'm paying attention to what the carpenters are doing with leveling the studs to put up the drywall. Like, oh, this is something I can do. Um, my husband and I can do this ourselves instead of having to pay the labor and all this other stuff. Um, and once the kids realize, I notice I catch their attention from that and then they end up reaching out to me afterwards to find out about building pathways, the pre-apprenticeship program or other vocational schools that or other programs that may be something similar like youth build as well. Um, but it's I just try to let them know, like you will end up retiring from the trades with an annuity and a pension. Once you hit that retirement age, 60, 62, who knows, it might be older once they get there, but you'll have something where you'll be able to live comfortable. And the insurance is just amazing. Um, I'm able to, I was able to have my child and not have a bill. Um, the bill I remember was like 90 grand. And then it said, my portion zero to pay for it. So people don't realize that we have vision, we have dental, and that's that's part of the in the envelope. Outside the envelope is your hourly pay. And then with the pie fitters, we get travel pay. So we get $15 a day on top of our regular pay because they know how expensive it is for gas and paying in the city of Boston or Cambridge um, for the parking lot. So it's like, I just, the pay part is what catches their attention because it's not talked about. And a lot of schools do speak about college. To, um, and it's not a bad thing going to college, but I let them know if you go through your apprenticeship, you don't have college debt. And then a lot of these unions actually help you get credits if you do decide to go to Wentworth, Benjamin Franklin Institute, Bunker Hill. Um, you can become a project manager. There's so many other endless possibilities after you're done with your apprenticeship. And, and I love what you're pointing out here, too, because I think we've had our older generations at times do young people a disservice in recent years in pushing the four year path as being the only career option that we can choose. And also, there's been a kind of a negative undertone that's been thrown towards traditionally what people call like blue collar work as far as, oh, you're not going to get paid. Oh, that's whatever. Or you'll hear somebody say something about, oh, you don't want to be a garbage person. And it's like that guy is making, you know, 40, 50 bucks an hour and he's got insurance and he's in a union and he's doing great. So, yeah, like go be a garbage person. It's going to be fantastic. And I think having those conversations and showing that the the options are, are different depending on what you want to do and where you want to be is huge. So I, I appreciate that context. Um, and what's your experience look like in that realm as far as some of those misconceptions go? 
I think Savvy hit a lot of the, you know, the nail on the head in that I think people don't realize how lucrative of an industry it can be, especially within the trades. I think um, that there's some misconceptions around, um, you know, it's a male dominated industry and it's, you know, it's very blue collar. It's not innovative. It's not tech forward. Some of the things that we've that we've mentioned earlier. Um, and I, I think that um, that people don't realize, as you mentioned, the the diversity of backgrounds and the um, the different educational profiles, um, the different pathways to get into this industry and the opportunities that are available to to someone um, seeking them. And I think um, there, you know, there's a misconception that a constru- a person in the industry looks and acts and is a certain way. Um, and I think that construction is really a melting pot, right? Like when you're out on the site every day, you're working with, you know, you're you're running out to get the foreman the right drawings, and then you're running back in and you're having a, a meeting with a, you know, a an owner or a top executive at a company that you're working with. And you're, you're interacting with so many different types of people on a day-to-day basis. Um, and again, they're all contributing to that bigger effort to get this building built. And I think um, that that is something that we really need to get out there and share. And you mentioned, you know, going to the schools and talking to the students and interacting with them and sharing those experiences and those stories. I don't think that's been um, done enough in the past, and I think that's a really important part of getting the next generation on board and showing them, you know, this industry is is an incredible place to be right now. It's on, you know, the brink of a total transformation. We're doing work more productively. Um, you guys are prefabbing things before they get out into the field. You're using new materials. You, there's different methodologies of, of building that are coming to play today. Um, and it's a really exciting space to be. And so I think it's all about, you know, sharing that uh, with the next generation. And can you build on that? Actually, it leads into my next question. And I, I think we've covered it a little bit, but I, there's likely a broader scope we can think about as far as all of our you know leadership teams out there who might be listening right now or thinking about you know how do we attract and retain new talent and find new ways to bring that diverse perspective that you're talking about into the industry are, are there other ways you think we should be considering right now to shift those misperce- uh, misperceptions that we're talking about here yeah I think um, I think a lot of it comes down to um, investing in the industry in a lot of ways. And what I mean by that is you'll hear a common a stat that gets thrown around. I think it um, it came from a McKinsey study at some point in time, but you'll hear, you know, there's 1% of revenue from construction gets invested in R&D. Yeah. Um, and you compare that to, you know, the healthcare industry, which is, I think it's closer to like 15% or tech, which is you know, over 20%. Yeah, very it's different perspective. Very <laughs> different, very different. And um, I think, you know, one of, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that um, we've done at Suffolk is we've we've really turned that upside down and we've really taken an approach of, um, of investing in the future and what the industry could look like, not what it looks like today. Um, and I think a big piece of that is investing in innovation and technology and being willing to make a bet and take a chance on a startup, being willing to take a bet on, you know, an, an employee with a with a different background that wants to solve problems and change the way the industry works. And I think when you get a lot of people with that mindset together, you can you can do really incredible things. And I um, and I think it really comes down to that. And so what I would say to our, you know, our leaders in the industry um, is make that investment. And um, and have that be a core part of your organizational strategy, um, because I, I think that's how we're going to get there. And I think that's a, that's not a single company conversation at that point too. That's that's an industry conversation. And and I'm I'm routinely encouraged by the the different customers and contractors and other people that I speak with because it is a very sharing and transparent industry. And I think many people do feel and adhere to that for the reasons that you're sharing right now, because if we don't, we're going to be in trouble in a not very far you know, moment in time from today. So I appreciate that perspective. Do you have anything else you'd like to add as far if, if you could yell upward at all of our leaders of today, is there anything <laughs> else we should be thinking about to, to fix some of those misconceptions? I know with Building Pathways, we do um, do blast and through social media. Um, we also talk about it at our Tradeswomen Tuesday meetings. And then we do the Mask Girl in Trades with 
the high school students from vocational high schools across the state will come to the IBEW Local 103. They get to speak to all the tradeswomen that are there. Um, I know Suffolk has a table there. There's other GCs that are there as well, um, not just the trades women that are there. Sometimes we'll go out to the community and post flyers about building pathways. So that way it's out there to the community because we need the residents to build their community. Um, also, I started a group called the Boston Union Trade Sisters. It's a private Facebook group. So we have a lot of sisters who actually have friends that may be interested that have a question. Oh, when does the pipe fitters accept applications? I have a friend. If they can't get into a pre-apprenticeship program, because it is hard like yeah. to get into a program, to get into a local as well. So sometimes they'll say, you know what, we'll try our luck by applying. We go tell them to go to the Build a Life MA dot org website as well so that way if somebody wants to know about different trades there's videos of different women in the trades and they can actually decide like oh what like i said i wanted to be an iron worker before i got on the trades but then when i went to the pipe for this i was like oh this is what i want to be instead like it's a little bit cleaner um and a little bit easier than because i know i've seen my friends they're kind of rough around the edges but <laughs> they're both great careers don't get me wrong um but yeah, we do we do a lot of blasts, like social media blasts and email blasts. Anytime I know there's an info session coming up, I'll send it to some of my guys who need the information to give to their kid or somebody in their family members. And they're all, I'm an instructor also for Building Pathways for the nighttime from September to Janu um, December. So I try to send that out, too. So we get a lot of applicants for it, too. So we we try to um, pick out the best for the program as well. You're clearly putting the work in at this point to uh, to, to get that message out there, which I'm, I'm encouraged by. I'm, I'm going to have to reach out and get some of the links from you for this because I want to make sure that everybody listening has an oppor opportunity to check out some of the programs that you're talking about here. Yes. And, and so there's, there's just so much, but... I think I hope other regions are doing something similar because we have to put in that work because if Definitely. we're not, then we're going to continue having the same perceptions. We're not going to get the message out and we're going to struggle to find more people that are interested in, you know, bringing their skill set and their perspective to the industry. Because if it's if it's all the same perspective as well, that's also a, a risk to companies because you need that diversity to help ensure that we're tackling problems that meet the needs of everybody and not just one particular opinion or, or thought. And so... It's clear you're both very passionate about this industry, which I appreciate very much. And it's why I was excited about inviting both of you to be here today. And what do you think it is that sparks such a drive in this industry? And we might have touched on it a little bit, but I'd like to just kind of, you know, hit that nail on the, the head of the hammer today. But what sparks this drive to, to get you involved beyond uh, the scope of your jobs? And how can we instill that in others as they start getting into the industry? I'm going to kick that one your way, Kelsey. Um. I think a lot of people probably listening and um, and I think a lot of people in the industry would agree that, you know, the, the built world is um, what drives my passion for construction. And what I mean by that is um, all of us, one way or another, interact with buildings every single day. Day, right? and most we, people don't think about it. Like construction touches everybody, but if you're if you're not in it, it's very easy to just be like, okay, that's the building that I work in, and that's <laughs> the building I live in. Right. And, and you know, we're all nerds, so we go sixteen layers deeper and go, well, <laughs> but look at all that. <laughs> and you know, when a construction project is going on next door, you're probably not always the happiest neighbor. No one <laughs> loves the construction project being next door, right? But the reality is, that's the work that it takes to create the places that we live, that we work where we go for our doctor's appointments, um, where we go to, you know, gyms, restaurants, where we spend time with our families. And and that is the built world. And it's um, it's not just building about those individual buildings, right? It's about building those communities. And we talked about the Parcel 12 job at the beginning of the, of the podcast. And um, to me, that project symbolizes so much more than just two buildings, right? It's it's being built over the Massachusetts Turnpike, um, and it's it's a way of connecting 
um, communities. And, you know, we've built under the city of Boston now. We built the big dig. We went underneath the city and now we're building over it and we're trying to find more space to put more buildings. Um, but it's it's really an incredible feat when you think about it in that way, which is, you know, it's a place for green spaces. You can put places for people to come together and walk their dog and go for a walk after work. And um, and I, I think, you know, when you think about it in, from that perspective, you're, you really are building communities and you're shaping the future and the landscape of what our cities are, are going to look like. Um, and I think that is what, you know, makes me tick. That's what gets me up every morning. That's what get me gets me excited about work is contributing to that effort and contributing to having our people out in the field that are building those buildings, um, which is, is what it comes down to, right? Like, you know, people build buildings and giving those people and equipping them with, you know, the tools and the things that they need to get their job done as efficiently, as safely as possible. That's what's important. Um, and that's what keeps me going. It's like 10 clicks deeper on the the I built that talk track than <laughs> than you could possibly get. But it's <laughs> it's so community driven and it's so impactful into you know, just how we live our lives. So I, I think that's a great lever to pull on when we're just sharing that with others. Um, Savvy, do you have a similar perspective or, or what do you think on, on that as far as sparking that passion to be involved? Kelsey said a lot. Um, it's it's I would say being on a job site like even though I may have not been there from the very, very beginning, I may have came on like the sixth floor, but being able to see them put the beams up and like seeing all the different things put in by different trades, different level skills. Um, it's just like, wow. Like, and I, I enjoy seeing like the different trades around me working as well. Like it's, it's, it's amazing. Like, cause it's just like, wow, they're doing something different than I'm doing, but everything all, relates to each other as well like and then being able to like go to a family's house and seeing something off and then helping them fix it too it's like that like it just I, I just have like a um how can I say it's it's just a warm feeling to be able to say you know what I received a skilled trade to be able to pass this knowledge on even if they didn't join the trade or like my dad who's a retired Boston public school teacher able to help fix a broken pipe that bursted because of the winter um letting them know like this is how it gets fixed turning off the valves cutting the pipe that bursted and replacing it with just a couple things and then being done like i i just i, I like I, it was just me um no it's great you're empowered to do right you know, and take action in a way that not everybody necessarily has the skill set to to take advantage of whether they've you know just not been given the opportunity to develop it or didn't have the interest right to, to even when you get to take those skills home and say okay like i can still help my family my friends and you know my own personal space outside of the the built environment that you're touching every day at your work it's it's a really cool relationship and not everybody has the privilege to have that connecting thread that they get to take home with them every day too so that's really cool right knowing that i have so many zones to control my heat when we bought our house i was like oh why do you know that i'm like that's my job actually hvac but being able to know like the thermostat's like oh we have four different ones so i'm not wasting oil like <laughs> it's funny like just, it's the little things yeah it's all connected yeah it's good so i've got two final questions for both of you today one all of our listeners are very familiar with and it's one of my favorites as well and it's back to the the, the tools conversation. And so what is what is one tool that you'll always bring to every project, no matter what uh, project you're working on? Kelsey, how about you? So I thought a little bit about this one. I am going to give you a boring, a little bit of a boring answer, but I, I really do believe it. Um, and it, it's really, um, it is the tool that I would take with me everywhere, which is, which is my smartphone. Um, and I say smartphone instead of, you know, cell phone or mobile phone, because they really have gotten that much smarter over the years. And, um, you know, originally when this, the phones we have today, um, which it, it feels weird, it's not on me, you know, it's part, it's like an appendage <laughs> at this point. Um, but, uh, the, the phones we have today, you know, 15 years ago would have been the size of a football field. So in terms of their computing power. And people would have, their minds would have been blown be, yeah. too. And now we're just like, nah, I'm going to go scroll yeah, TikTok. Not, exactly. <laughs> um, and we effectively have a supercomputer in our pockets when we walk around today. And we have the world at our fingertips. And it's not just about communicating anymore. It's not just about picking up the phone to call somebody. It's actually a 
a platform or really a, a portal to the entire, you know, rest of the world. And so my phone, when I take it out to the field, it's it's loaded up with all of our toolbox apps. Every app that we're developing today in-house, we're considering, you know, how do we create a mobile first solution for that? And I really do see the job site of the future is going to be mobile forward. All of our trade partners have smartphones um, and they take those out on the job site with them. It's a, a really effective way to communicate with everyone on the job site, to keep everybody safe, to give them the most up-to-date information to inform them of any changes in plans, any anything going on from a safety perspective. So it really is that vehicle for information sharing on the project level. It's a way to keep our sites safe and secure, track, you know, um, who's working on the job site on a day-to-day basis, make sure we have the right counts of people. So if we have to, you know, evacuate the site for any reason. So to me, it's just, it's, um, it's that fiber that's going to connect us all um, in something that, an infrastructure that exists today on our sites and, um, and, I think it's going to be it, it for me. It would be something that I would never go to another job site without. It's it's crazy because we have the depth of human knowledge available in this thing that's just sitting on the table in front of me right now. <laughs> like the the wealth of human knowledge, to the most part, we can find here if we want to. But you're right too in the sense that this was the catalyst that started changing construction technology out in the field. It introduces another layer that has some equitable and other conversation points too, as far as access goes, because as you start stepping either into more rural communities or areas in the world that don't have that access, the conversation has to change a little bit to ensure that that data transfers there. But it's still such a big lever that we get to pull. And so I wouldn't call it a boring answer, but (laughs) but it is a very relevant one because it's the baseline of how we get a lot of our work done now. And it replaces so much wasted time just running back and forth to the project trailer or lugging plans around and building off outdated things. There's there's so many things there. So I I like that answer. Savvy, how about you? What's one tool that you bring to every project, no matter what you're working on? I would say my can do good attitude. I like that. (laughs) Um, Only because like, I feel like if I was to hit my toe that morning before going to work, I'm going to have a miserable day and I'm not going to be able to focus on it. And I'm just going to be miserable. My work, it's going to show my work and everything. Um, But if I hit my toe and I was like, oh, I just hit my toe and I just go on like forgetting about it, then I go to work with a good attitude and even if it's like the crappiest thing I got to do, like I can get through with it with a good attitude. That way um, it, it'll show, like I said, it shows into your, it shows in your work. Like if you're going to be miserable working, it's like you're not going to get finished on time or it's not going to be fun for you to do. But if you have that attitude to keep going and getting along with um, people on the job, it, it works out in your favor. Like if, I'm short on something and there's a plumber right next to me because our work's very similar when it comes to like fittings. If I got to just use his, um, a Jaws for a pro press, like a half inch I don't have and he's right there or she's right there, I can just use it real quick and then there, I'm finished with that piece. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good attitude. Like it, in saying good morning to somebody, it might have made their day too on the job site. I've And I've even seen research now that shows that being very intentional about having that positive mindset brings so much more to your own wellness beyond just, you know, how you feel that particular day. And so as I've gotten older too, I've, I've realized that like if I start my day and I'm sour and I carry that through my day, there's, there's impact that lingers beyond just work and, you know, personal life. And so when you're focused in that way, I think it impacts both yourself and everybody around you. So I, I like that answer. That's great. Thanks. So one more question for both of you, Kelsey, If our listeners are interested in reaching out to you or if there's anything that you'd like to share with them, this is your opportunity to do so. So please feel free. Yeah. So, um, of course, you can reach out to me over LinkedIn, um, Kelsey Gager. You can find me on there. Just in terms of parting words, I guess um, uh, I'll just leave you with this, which is that transformations that we want to see in the in, in the industry and the change that we um, believe is possible. Uh, I know that no one is going to do it alone. And what I mean by that is no single general contractor, no technology company, no you know trade partner subcontractor is going to um, make all of the things a reality that we've talked about today. And so um, it's really going to come down to collaboration and working across, um, you know, with different 
companies in the space that all do different things. And I look forward to collaborating with people on on realizing um, that vision that we all have um, and making it a reality. So I'll leave you with that. And yeah, please reach out. I'd love to chat with anyone. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, it's it's a global problem and the challenges that we talked about today and so many other challenges our industry is facing, they're big enough at scale where for us to tackle them in the timeline that we need to, it can't be a single company, person, area, geo. This is this is a global conversation, and we have a lot to learn from all the different regions. Like I could go nerd out for ten minutes about you know the data standards you see in parts of the United Kingdom and Singapore and such, and how that commonality at the fed- at the government level applies to the industry. We can learn a lot about uh, you know what we should be doing in our own countries instead of just you know state to state or geo to geo. So there's a lot I can unpack there. I'm not going to do it today. But Savvy, how about you? Is there a, a good way for people to reach out, or is there something that you'd like to share with our listeners today? I can be reached um, at Tradeswomen Tuesday, which is every first Tuesday of each month. It's held at 1705 Columbus Ave in Boston, Mass. Um, everybody's welcome to learn about the trades is different panel of women there. Sometimes we have GCs. I believe we had Suffolk there one time at our old building on Washington Street in Roxbury. Um, and I'm normally there every first Tuesday or you can actually contact um, Mary Vogel, who is the executive director for Building Pathways or Nancy Luke, who is the Deputy director, they're usually there on Tradeswomen Tuesday as well. If I'm not there, they can always put you into reach with me. Awesome. Well, we'll also see if I can get some of the links to those pieces of information to add into the show notes as well. But everybody out there listening, once again, thank you for joining me for another episode of Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, you really should head over to YouTube. We are in the Tech Center in Boston right now, and it is a beautiful space, as my guest can attest to right now. If you're interested in reaching out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn, of course. Uh, I am Eric Thomas, if you haven't figured that out by now. Otherwise, you could chase me on Twitter at builder under score digital. And finally, please, please take a moment to rate us in whatever player you're listening to, or go find us on YouTube and follow uh, Autodesk Construction Cloud. The playlist for all of these episodes is there, plus a whole bunch of other really cool content. And I'd be very excited to hear from you if you do reach out. And on that final note, goodbye.